Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to this talk, um, being systematic with System D. Um, Got to admit, this is not in any way systematic. In actual fact, I just like the alliteration when I thought of the title, so you can ignore that bit. Uh, but it is about system D, so that's okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, agenda. So, this is um, really about how uh, system D uh, relates to the embedded use cases. So, there seems to be a little resistance in some cases uh, to using system D. So, maybe I'm going to break that down. Um, Having looked at the, uh, or having reviewed the slides, I realised I've got way too many here. Um, so I may just stop at some point, and uh, you'll have to come back uh, next year for the, the, the retread, or, or, or season two, as I call it. Um, but we'll see how it goes. Also, I'm doing some demos, so every, anything could go wrong, and almost certainly will. So I've done this, um, look, I've, I've talked about System D uh, in the past. Uh, back in, in uh, ELC Europe uh, in Lyon, I spoke about, uh, we need to talk about System D, which is really all about um, uh, identifying boot, uh, uh, boot, boot uh, speed issues. So I'm not going to cover that this time around. Um, so we're going to be booting quite slowly, in fact. So using System D to boot and manage embedded Linux systems with demos. Okay, so concepts. The, the, the key idea, I think, of system D is that if you write down all the things that need to be done during boot, and if you put in explicit dependencies between all of those components, then you end up essentially with a tree structure. Uh, and then you can write a daemon which can walk through that tree structure um, heading for some target, and once you reach that target, you've started everything that needed to be started. So key concept here then is that, uh, that we have dependencies, uh, we have targets, um, the, uh, the components are called units, and the unit is a very simple uh, f uh, file format uh, type. It's based roughly on um, Microsoft.ini files, in fact. Um, and then the units can be used to express all kinds of different things. The main thing we're going to be talking about are services, uh, which, you can, which we call daemons. But there are various other types of unit which we will go through. So here's a unit. Uh, so like I say, it's a very simple format. Uh, it's just a text file. Uh, it begins with a unit section. So the sections are in square brackets. And then in this case, uh, we just have a description um, and uh, some reference to, to some documentation and a dependency a requires. Uh, full information about units at that link there at the bottom. So within the unit section of your unit, um, this is where you express the dependencies. Um, so I'm going to talk about requires and wants uh, mostly, but also there's another one called conflicts. So requires then, this is the key one, this says that this unit requires these other units. In other words, when I activate this unit, I must also, or rather system D, must also activate these other units. Uh, we have also another keyword called wants, which kind of does the same thing, except it's not fatal if you can't start the other units, whereas with requires, that is a hard dependency. It's a fatal error if you can't start those units. And then there's also a thing called conflicts, which is a negative dependency. So that is saying that this unit cannot coexist with some other units. And if we try and start this one, we must stop the, must stop the other ones first. And I want to introduce the idea of an activation queue. So these three keywords are going to add, or in the case of conflicts, remove things from an activation queue. So that's a list of things that system D has to do as a result of whatever caused this to happen. Now, two related but different uh, con uh, keywords are before and after. 
So these are not dependencies, these are to do with ordering. So in other words, when we process the activation queue, in which order are we going to process those, um, th th those units? So fairly straightforward, before is a list of things that must run before I run this unit, and after, things I must run afterwards. Uh, so here's a simple example. Um, uh, yeah, if I'm starting a, a web server, then uh, in this case we have it's, it must be after the network target. The same is reasonable. We don't want to start the web server until the network is running. So let me illustrate this with a rather crude diagram. So, and I, I want to get across this idea of the difference between dependencies and ordering. There are different concepts within system D. So dependencies, these are created then by things like requires. So here, two units, A, B, and C, sorry, three units, A, B, and C. Uh, when I start A, it's going to start B and C because they are dependencies. So as a result of this, we'll find that uh, if you look, if you were to look at the activation queue, we have uh, those three units there in some arbitrary order. I've written them as A, B, C because that's the most likely order they would end up, but in principle, there can be any order. And when system D comes to execute the activation queue, there is no ordering here, so it can do whatever it likes. And typically what it will really do is run them in parallel. So one of the nice things about system D is it parallelizes everything. So you'll end up that A, B, and C on a quad core system, they are each gonna start up in a, on a separate core. This may be not what you want. So this is why we have uh, the, the before, before and after things. These set the order of things that we're going to process from the activation queue. So here I've put in an after statement which says that unit A must run after unit B. I haven't done anything with unit C. So in this case then, the activation queue um, will run uh, B, then A, and C, we don't know. It will, it will run C at any time it likes. But the key thing is we guarantee now that it's gonna run B uh, before A. Okay? Um, so, question for the audience then. What do you think will happen if I leave out the requires and leave in the after? So supposing between A and B, I have an after statement, but no requires. So who thinks that will run unit B? Hands up. <laughs> okay. Some people were willing to commit. So who thinks that unit B will not be started? Uh, a few more. Excellent. Well, you are correct. Unit B will, just having an after statement in there will not cause unit B to run at all. Um, if, it's, uh, if it wasn't already in the activation queue, an after statement will not add it to the activation queue. That's what the requires is for. Okay, so these units, um, they are um, stored in, in, in various places in the system, and this is the search path that system D will go through when it's looking for these units. Um, and there are some others as well. You can change this at compile time if you really want to. Uh, but the basic idea then is that the distribution wide, the, the, the default set of units are going to be in lib system D system. But you can override those by putting uh, um, other versions into either run system D system or etc system D system. The run stuff you generally don't mess around with because that's volatile and that is handled by system D at runtime. But you can go and put uh, stuff into ETC system D system and this is how you can override the default behavior without going and hacking around in stuff uh, in the uh, lib uh, system D system directory. So for example, if you decide that you don't want a particular unit to run at all, you simply need to create uh, a unit with exactly the same name, but in the etc systemd system directory. And that can just be an empty file, or if you wish, you can create it, create it as a symlink to devnull or something like that. And that will then mask 
the default version, the, the, the system-wide default version, which is going to be in the lib directory. Okay, so that's got the basis of units out of the way. Let's start doing something useful with them. So we want to start services. So a service is a daemon, it's something that does something. So for these, we have units that are something.service, and they must have a service section because that's where you say what the service is. So here's a simple example. Um, this is a slightly edited version of the light TTP daemon uh, unit. And you can see we've got a service section there. We have an exec start. So that's the command line that is run when we start, uh, uh, in this case, like TTPD. And um, just for the fun of it, there's also an exec reload statement which says what will happen if we restart it. So quite often daemons have a restart function which is different from shutting you down and starting up again. In this case, it's going to send it a seek hub uh, to, the, to the daemon. So a little bit more detail on that. Um, first of all, types of service. So we can have, uh, first of all, simple services. So the majority of services fall into the simple category. Since this is the default, you don't have to actually put anything here. So a simple service is just a program you want to run in the background, um, end of. Um, but it will be restarted. So if that service terminates for some reason, hopefully it won't, but if it did, the system will automatically restart it. If you don't want that, then you declare it to be a one-shot. So that means we'll start the service once. When it finishes, we just forget about it. So one-shots are handy for things um, which it means running a program and then you're done. So it could be a shell script would be a good example of doing that. Something which you just want to do once, for example, at boot time, which does something, then it's done. Um, the third type I've got here is uh, forking services. Um, this is a little bit obscure, I guess, but if you write a service, sorry, if you write a daemon in the traditional uh, Unix way, um, which you can do using the daemon uh, um, uh, system call, then that means that when you, when you launch it, it then automatically, it actually forks a new copy of itself and runs in the background. So it demonizes. So if you have a service uh, of that sort, then you have to declare it as being a forking daemon because it means that it's going to do the backgrounding within the program itself rather than being backgrounded by systemd. Um, Exxar, as that reload we mentioned. Oh yeah, one other random thing which was from the previous uh, slide. Uh, notice down here we have this reference to dollar main PID. Um, so dollar main PID is actually um, a environment variable set up by systemd, and as you might expect, it is the PID of the service that was started. And in this case, um, we're using that to refer back, so we, when, when we send the seek up, seek up uh, we know where to send it to. There are a whole bunch of other environment variables which I haven't gone into, um, but um, if you do a man systemd exec, that will tell you. Okay, so that's the basis. I'm not going to go into any more detail uh, at the moment than that. Um, in a moment, I'm going to do a demo. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to have to interact with systemd. And I do that using systemctl. So systemctl is the command line interface to systemd. And here are some of the, kind of, of the useful things you can do uh, with systemctl. So start, stop. Yeah, well, I'll go through these bit by bit. Now, for the demo, I'm going to be using the Octo project, because what else would I use? Um, First thing then is that by default, um, for whatever reason, Yocto is going to be using System 5 in it, not System D. So you'll have to go and make a, a tweak 
uh, and you need to add init manager system D, for example, to the conf local conf file or into pretty much any other conf file. Okay, so demo part one. So the demo is to start a daemon called Boris. Um, so Boris is a completely useless daemon. Um, yeah, I, th I, th I think you've got it, you've got it. Um, and um, so it's built using uh, Yocto, not exactly the latest version, apologize for that. I never quite got around to uh, rebuilding the whole thing since I uh, put the original demos together. Um, and anyhow, so it's, um, uh, it's a version of uh, the Kirkstone um, using systemd 250 and is running on QEMU ARM. So bear with me, this could go wrong, but it may not, you never know. So I do like um, presentations with, uh, with, with demos in. It, it shows that the presenter has you know, gone through some pain to get to this point. So this is pretty much out of the box. I've only made a couple of small changes to the, the default config. Right, so I have another crib sheet over here, which I'm going to use uh, to remember what I have to do here. So we should find that Boris is not currently running because I hope I haven't enabled it. No, oh, okay, it is running. Hmm. Well, okay, imagine it wasn't. <laughs> um, yeah. um, so, well, okay, so I, I do system D, uh, sorry, system CTL uh, status, name of the, uh, name of the, uh, the, the service, Boris, and it says it's a useless daemon, and it's currently active, and it's running, um, which I didn't really want it to do, but never mind. Uh, because I wanted to demonstrate that I can start it and stop it. So I can do stop. Don't see why that shouldn't work. And status, yeah. This is, this is how it's meant to be to start with. So it should now say that it is uh, stopping a use, useless daemon, stop to useless daemon. Yeah, that'll work fine. And then, as you can imagine, I can start it again by using start. So the point is then that I, I can control this daemon, if I can spell start, there we go. And as it runs, you can see it says it's running for, in this case, zero seconds. Um, yeah, that was basically it. Okay, so that um, has got over the idea, I think, of services. Services are demons, that's easy. Um, let's talk a little bit about targets and dependencies. This is, in my opinion, slightly non-intuitive. So a target is another type of unit. It ends in .target. Um, but the targets themselves don't do anything. They are simply a, um, a, a, a configuration point. And then we can have things depend on those targets so that when we reach a certain target, it will have started a whole bunch of demons. So a good example of this is the multi-user target. Uh, so this is the, the uh, entry for the multi-user target. Um, and you can see it requires basic target. Uh, it conflicts with some things and it should come after the basic target and after rescue service and rescue target have been stopped. And so you can see then that there are other targets. In this case, we have basic target being referenced here. And if you were to go and look at basic target, you'll see that depends on some other targets. The slightly confusing thing is that when you start looking at the dependencies of targets, they all, they mostly just depend on each other. And you, or at least I got to the point of thinking, I don't know how this works. How does anything start if it's, if it's only targets and the targets don't actually do anything? 
come to that in a moment. Oh yes, the default target. So what target are we going to launch at boot time? That is the default target. And that is usually done as a symbolic link to the target you want. So in this case, the default target is going to multi-user target as we just saw. And you can just change that sim uh, symbolic link if you want to start a different default target or you can do essentially the same th thing through a systemctl uh, command or you can even do it through the kernel command line. So back to these dependencies then. How do these dependencies actually work if they aren't any explicit dependencies on services in these targets? So it turns out there are these things called uh, outgoing, sorry, these things called incoming dependencies. So the things we just looked at just now, uh, requires and wants, those are outgoing dependencies. They are from this unit, they are pointing to other units. Incoming dependencies, as you can probably guess, go the other way. And they are expressed through the keyword wanted by. And the wanted by keyword goes into another section called install. I'll explain for in a moment why it is called that. Um, so, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So here we can see in the install section, we have wanted by multi-user target. So that says that when the multi-user target is started, this is, the, this is a dependency of the multi-user target, so this will get started. So, we have incoming dependencies, we have, I have outgoing dependencies. So this means then that when I start target at the top of the screen here, that is going to start up all those units, in this case services, uh, that have a wanted by uh, link in there. So how does this actually work? Um, so the secret here is the idea of installing or enabling uh, a unit. When you enable a unit, you, uh, systemd will process the install section and it will install the wanted by link. And in actual fact, that is done as a symbolic link. So if I enable my simple daemon, and then if I go looking into system etc system, I find there's a directory called multi-user target dot wants. So this is where the wanted by links go. When I install simple daemon, it puts a link in that directory to my service. And then when we get to the um, uh, when we get to the multi-user target, uh, it's going to go through all these links and add those onto the activation queue. Okay, so that's it. So wanted by is putting a link into me so that when the target usually uh, is started, it will add me to the dependency queue and then my program will get to run. Um, yeah, so you may wonder why do it in this slightly obscure way. Um, the reason is that if you weren't, if we didn't have this facility, then every time I added a new service to my system, I would have to go and edit the multi-user target. And I'd be forever adding things in and taking things away and the whole thing becomes unmanageable. So by not encoding that information into the target unit, and by instead encoding it in the system unit that you're installing, then it becomes much more modular. So when I install my, my service, it says, ah, I am part of the multi-user target. So this symbolic link uh, takes care of that. Okay, so in order for that link to be created, then you have to run the system and do systemctl install, uh, sorry, systemctl enable, da da da. That obviously doesn't work so well, um, particularly in the embedded case where nobody's ever going to do that. So you can add uh, an extra couple of lines to your uh, uh, BitBake class, and you just need to add this stuff here, basically. There is a, um, there's a BB class called systemd, 
and then you just tell it what the service is that you want to belong to, a uh, simple Deven service. That will then install the unit. The unit has an install section. The install, she install section has a wanted by uh, statement. So that when I build this, I'm going to find that this symbolic link to my uh, daemon has already been created as part of the Yocto uh, do root FS build. So now boot it up, and in this case, simple daemon will be running. Okay, demo, enable Boris to boot. Well, I've kind of already done this because I screwed up the demo previously, so. Um, but I can show, where's my crib gone to? Yeah, well, I can do it from here. Um, so yeah, if I look into uh, etc, uh, system D, system multi-user once. And so now you can see uh, boris.service is a symbolic link now to boris.service. So that's why it keeps on uh, booting up and I forgot to do essentially a factory reset before I started the demos. Never mind. Uh, but you can also see there's a bunch of other things that have been started up using the same mechanism. Um, what else do I want to do? So we can look at dependencies. Okay, let's print out quite a large list. Um, so these are the it, when I run list dependencies, as I just did. Um, by default, it's going to give you the dependencies of the default target, so that's why default target is up here at the start. And then you see all the things that depend on that and, and the dependencies of those and so on down the tree. And somewhere, yeah, there it is. Somewhere we can see here is Boris in that list. Good old Boris. Um, another thing that's slightly interesting, I think, to do is if I do that... So I would just crudely um, just look at the targets in my, in my dependency tree. These are, here you can see the, the, the hierarchy of the various targets. So here's the default target. That depends on basic target. You know that because it was in the slide. Hope you remember this uh, from about five minutes ago. Uh, basic target then depends on some other stuff and then some others and some others. So you can see the, the hierarchy uh, of the various targets. And I could if I want to go into more detail about this, but I don't have the time. Uh, but you can see that the, the most basic targets are local FS target, which is going to mount the local file systems. Swap target, which is going to mount the, the swap. Um, Sysinit is going to start anything that needs to be started as a result of that, and so on and so on. Uh, yeah, that'll do, I think. Okay, right. So that was, that's the 101. Um, I don't know, probably good if I, I would do a, does anybody have any questions at this point? Now would be a, 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 a suitable time to take uh, questions so far. Okay, so the, the, the question is, uh, somewhere, yeah, I should, uh, serves me right for leaving this bit, I should, I should have deleted this, sli this bit of the slide. So here we have, um, this is the multi-user target, uh, it conflicts with the rescue service and rescue target, so essentially this is when you boot up in rescue mode, if there is such a thing, typically a, a RAM disk or something. Um, but after, uh, basic, sorry, after basic target, which makes sense because that's the, in, the, in the boot up sequence, but also it has after rescue service and rescue target, which are these two things here, which is kind of slightly weird. What it means is, uh, counterintuitively maybe, after they have been stopped. 
So if they were to be uh, started, we would have to... I'm not, I'm not sure this actually could work, happen actually in practice. Uh, but yeah, it just means that we need to make sure that they have uh, finished stopping before we can start this service. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in the graph that you showed with the dependence with A, B, and C on units. This wonderful that oops, gone the wrong way. No, that way. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um Yeah, I've, sorry, I'm doing the wrong thing here. Let's go back. Yeah, yeah. yeah this bit here. Let's find it. What happens if unit B is terminated? Yeah, then unit A will retain. Um, the, the, the simplest configuration is, uh, as, as, as we're going through here, the simplest configuration is that if unit B stops, then that's fine. You can put additional statements in here that say that if unit B stops, we should do things with, with unit A, for example. But by default, that's not what's, what's going to happen. So if unit B stops, yeah, that's fine. You can configure that, but I'm, that, that's not that's not a case that I'm, I'm going to go into. But yeah. Okay. One more question, then I will move on. But yes, sir. Will the dependencies also matter if you disable a service? Yeah, or stop it. Or will the dependencies Yeah. Yeah, so that, that, that is orthogonal in that if I disable unit B, well, typically unit B would be disabled anyhow because it's going to get started as a result of this requires link here. So you would have a, you would have a wanted by link to uh, unit A, and then as a result of that being activated, that will then follow the outgoing dependencies from that, and so it will start up these. So usually units B and C, in this case, would not be activated by a wanted by. They will be activated at arm's length, if you like, because of the required statement here for unit A. So you have unit A is, is, is dependent on the target. When unit A gets started, we also want to start units B and C because they are in some way related to each other. OK. Um, Need to move on because time moves on. So, um, uh, um, what time do we finish? We finish at. Can somebody tell me what the, what the end time of this is? I forgot to make a note of it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So I'm going to have to go through the next bits fairly quickly. I might go into Steve Rostat mode. If you know Steve Rostat, you know what I'm talking about. Um, but I'll try not to be too, um, yeah. So next thing then. Uh, as I've described it so far, that's a great for a kind of static system where you know exactly what you know, what, what you need at a boot time. And every time you boot it up, you want to do the same thing. Sometimes that's not what you want. You want something a bit more dynamic. So we'd like to be able to load services on demand. And we can do this through these things called sockets. Uh, so a socket is another type of unit. Um, and it is essentially a trigger to system D. So when the conditions of the socket are, are met, then system D will do something. It will start a service, typically. So, for example, uh, here I have a socket unit called foo.socket. Um, it has a socket section, and it says listen stream 1234, 
accept no, come to that in a moment. And it's, um, it's got a wanted by on the sockets target. So this means then that uh, as a result of this, uh, system D will be listening on TCP socket uh, 1234. When we get an incoming connection on socket 1234, it's going to start, what is it going to start? It's actually going to start foo.service. Come to that in a moment. So, sockets are the way that we can trigger events and then have system D run other units for us. Uh, the most obvious example of this would be um, regular sockets. So we can have uh, TCP sockets, uh, we can have local sockets, but we can also have a bunch of other things which aren't really sockets at all. So we can have FIFOs, device nodes, um, okay, that is a socket, <laughs> messages, um, and um, USB function FS endpoints. So all of these things you can arrange the system, system D, to launch something when there is an event on one of those things. By default then, it's going to launch a service with the same name as the socket. So my foo socket is going to launch a foo service. If you don't want that, then you can override that with in the uh, socket section, you can put um, uh, the service and you can give it a different service name and that'll be run. Uh, as well as sockets, you can listen on uh, files. So in this case, listen special dev rf kill. When we get any kind of input on dev rf kill, that's gonna trigger this socket and that will then run the rf kill service. Okay, so there's no filtering here. It, it, basically, it's just going to open that file and do a read. Actually, it's going to do an e-poll on that. When we get uh, some data arriving on that uh, file, that then is going to trigger this thing. Um, service templates. I'm going to have to skip this because, um, as I expected, we're running out of time. Um, so I'll just skip that stuff. And I'm also going to skip the demo, but I was going to do a demo of uh, launching SSH. So if you were to look at the, the, uh, the implementation, it is by default not running an SSH daemon. But when I make a connection to it, um, there is a socket for port 22 that will then launch, in this case, drop bear. And away you go. Um, similar concept are with timers. So this is another type of unit something.timer. Um, it's a similar kind of concept in that this is an event, but now it's a time-based event. So I can say after something, so delay for some number of minutes before we run a service, or we can do it on a, on a regular basis, like a cron job, or whatever. Restarting services. Again, going through this fairly quickly now. Resilience. So when your service terminates, what do you want to do about it? Well, you can do this with the restart option. So we have, uh, da, da, da. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. So on failure is the most useful one. So that says if my service fails or if the, the program fails, then I want to restart. Of course, this may not always give you the result that you want you can end up where you keep on restarting and it keeps on uh, going, uh, you know, it's just gonna crash again. What else is it gonna do? So you can put rate limiting on this uh, as shown here. So this says, if it terminates twice in 30 seconds, then give up. We're no longer gonna try restarting this thing. You can also do other things. You can get it to run a program. So on failure, we can actually get it to run another service which could do some kind of remedial stuff. And you can take it to the extreme and actually put on failure action reboot. So that when my service fails, or when it's failed um, two times in 30 seconds, I'm going to reboot the system. Maybe that'll fix it. Quick bit, bit about watchdogs. So with a watchdog, we can have a service um, that is going to uh, ping uh, system D on a regular basis. 
if the pings are timed out, then we want to go into a failure state, and then we can recover in the various ways we just talked about. So we do this by putting watchdog sec 30, um, and then restart on watchdog. When the watchdog times out, we're going to restart this service. To make this work, you need to put a bit of code into your program. You need to call SD notify with that string. You can also have systemd itself protected by a hardware watchdog. Um, you just put a bit of code into the system conf, and this says that systemd, when it starts up, is going to use the hardware watchdog if it's, if it's available, and um, uh, but, 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 yeah, so in this seconds uh, section here, you, you give the, the timeout, say, 30 seconds or a minute or something. Resource limits, going to have to go through this pretty quickly. We can put limits on things so that we, uh, um, yeah, so we can put limits on, on CPU usage, on memory usage, and that's it. <laughs> there we go. Thank you.